Okay, well, um, warm welcome to Dorset Humanists as usual. Um, our speaker this evening is Dan Beaton. Dan is on the staff of Humanist Global Charity, which is based in California, uh, but it's a truly global organization. It works in 49 different countries around the world. Dan, teach, Dan is a teacher. Um, he teaches critical thinking, sexual health, and nutrition. He studied philosophy to MA level at the University of Birmingham. He lives with his partner in London, and they had the first humanist wedding in East Africa. And I'm sure you will join me in giving Dan a silent at the moment, but very warm welcome. So um, as usual, we are recording this event. If you don't want to be seen on the recording of your video uh, for the uh, duration. Okay, so uh, let me, so Dan, if you'd like to unmute yourself and then you can share screen, we'll be able to get, get going. Is that all looking okay? Can you see that? Yeah, that's that's coming up well. Right. Okay. I'll just uh, I'll just start with a quick correction. I was at the University of Bristol, not to disrespect Birmingham or anything, but you know that, that's the university I went to. So not too far. Okay. From me. My parents are actually from uh, Dorset, anyway. So um, so a bit of a connection to the the West Country. Great. Um, right, so yeah, what I try and do um, with today's talk is I'll, I'll try and give you a bit of a broad overview of what the charity itself does, much of which I'm not personally involved in. I only do a very specific thing within the organisation, but part of this is um, my, my, my employer, Hank, he was going to visit the UK um, long before COVID and go around to various humanist organisations and inform them about the work we do. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time just going over some of the things he probably would have shown you guys. And then I'll focus in on the particular work that I do with Humanist Global Charity. Right, so I'll just start with the aims of the actual organization. Uh, as the name suggests, we are a uh, charity. We work across the globe and we're broadly promoting humanist um, values. There's a big emphasis on education, promotion of science, and also good old fashioned philanthropy. Um, and we're mainly working in low income countries. We do do a bit of work in um, the United States of America, a bit of work now in Europe, but it's for less wealthy countries within Europe we, we've just started to focus on. Um, and yeah, as you can see on the PowerPoint there, there's a couple of the, the things we do. So sometimes it is something like, um, working in schools with young people, sometimes it's just funding individual people in their small business ventures, in particular um, people who, who are humanist affiliated. Now, I don't think I need to go into what humanism is here. Sometimes I give this talk to people who aren't in fact humanists, so we can skip that. As you mentioned, um, quite a lot of countries that we work within, I, I'm certainly not going to name all 49 of them. Myself, I'm, I've only been focused in Africa um, personally so far, but as you can see on the map, there's a, a spread of countries there, West Africa, Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, East Africa, places like Kenya, um, also Uganda, that was our starting place, um, and also the DRC in Central Africa, right down to South Africa, but also increasingly this year, as I'll, I'll move on to in some of the later slides, we're starting to work in um, Asia also. Right, so I just quickly talk about some of the challenges within Africa, and I'm sure you're aware of, of most of these anyway, but I'll just quickly uh, re recap these. So like most developing countries, um, African countries tend to be um, quite religious and or superstitious, often a fusion of the two. And the continent has obviously been under the, the influence of missionary work and um, in the north, north of the Sahara, very much of a strong Islamic influence. And as such, this creates an atmosphere that's quite often hostile to science, reason, free thought in general. And, you know, that's worrying in its own right if you are a champion of those things, but it does um, impede social progress, we would argue, within the charity. So it's not just, hey, my ideas 
I think my ideas are best. I want to get them out there. It's that we do genuinely think that through the application of science and free thought and reason, we can stand to better the lives of people who live in um, places like sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. Now, just in the next few slides, I'm just going to go through um, a bit of a history of the organisation, essentially some of the work we were doing in our uh, initial stages of formation. And as you mentioned earlier, we're a pretty new organisation. Actually, when the organisation was formed, it went by another name. You may have heard that name and hence that could be um, a source of confusion, but the organisation used to be called the Brighter, Brighter Brains. Um, and in that picture there, you've got Hank, who is the director of the organisation. And that chap there, some of you may be friends with him on Facebook, he's quite well connected among um, European humanists. Uh, Robert, he's based in Uganda and he, he, he does ceaseless work, you know, with young people building schools and doing all sorts to help in the community, um, a big science advocate. Um, and here we have um, the first atheist orphanage was built by um, Humanist Global under that, that earlier name of Brighter Brains, and that was in Western Uganda. Now, I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with, there's quite a few orphanages and schools that are humanist led in Uganda. And a lot of that was established by Humanist Global, even if other organizations came in at a later date to pick up and uh, fully fund those. Um, now moving into 2016, 2017, some of the other things we got up to in Uganda. Um, humanist schools again, and a humanist centre, just a kind of uh, a community based um, location, just where the people who are, you know, it's not a, a huge, huge community of humanists there, but, you know, there's churches everywhere. You go in countries like Uganda or Ghana, but there is very little in the way of places where humanists can meet, but it's not that different here, really. Um, then moving into 2018, here's some of the things we got up to. 31 workshops in critical thinking. I did not deliver any of those. That was before I joined the organization. Um, I think it was Leo Igwe, if um, I think that's how you pronounce his surname, who's got a few kind of TED talks. Um, you've probably seen some of those. He was doing the critical thinking teaching before I stepped in. He's a, a busy man. Um, entrepreneurial workshops. So yeah, encouraging businesses. Um, and startups for small businesses as well. Then 2019 to 2020, moving into Nigeria, among other places, providing a safe house for ex-Muslims. Um, obviously, you're quite familiar with the situation, no doubt, if you've been following the situation with Mubarak Bala and his imprisonment in Nigeria. That shows you just how perilous it is to be an outspoken ex-Muslim within um, certain states in, in Nigeria. So that's a real, um, a real treasure for people who are leaving Islam and need somewhere um, to be safe and to have a sense of community if they've been um, kind of pushed out of the family context in the uh, context of the Islamic community. And there was also a internet cafe set up uh, in, in 2020. Kenya, you can see the work, uh, well, some of the supplies that were provided to albino children. Albino children are often stigmatized, especially in places like East Africa, Tanzania in particular. In particular, that can be anything from just being ostracized, being treated as a kind of a bad omen, right through to being actually hunted for um, body organs to be used in various rituals, you know, there is almost... Uh, as valuable as ivory and all these other things that for some reason are believed to have um, special kind of healing properties or good luck properties. And then there, there was a, uh, an orphan centre also set up in Kasumu in Kenya. And um, their little farming equipment was provided and the emphasis very much is on self-sufficiency. So, you know, don't just give people food, although we do do that in some contexts when necessary, but it's about providing the community with the means to feed itself. These are pretty much givens and cliches within aid work these days. DRC, um, I think we are the first 
humanist organization um, to, to do work within the DRC in Central Africa. And you're probably aware of the plight there with civil war, Ebola. It's not a particularly easy country to live in. So these were some of the good things we got up to there. Um, alongside also um, mental health workshops, I think, last year as well. So for those people who had been suffering through loss in family, whether that's through Ebola or through the trauma of the Civil War, it's good that we can provide some kind of service there. Right, Ghana uh, 2020, quite a lot was going on there. I'm only giving you a few things that we actually did. If you go on our website, there's so much. Uh, there's no way I can cram it all into um, you know, a half hour presentation. So I'm just giving you a taster of some of the things that we get up to. Um, and that, there we were doing science workshops and vocational workshops aimed in Ghana, often at vulnerable girls, often at children who are in the so-called witch camps. Obviously these women aren't witches. There's no such thing as a real witch. These are women who've been stigmatized as witches and have been forced out of their communities. And so the children who live there often don't have access to any kind of education. We're trying to break that spell um, in terms of how um, women are perceived, how uh, superstition is perceived and how much uh, kind of weight it's given within the culture. So I think those workshops are, are, are very valuable. And then moving into 2021, these are just a couple of the things I picked off our website. And here we're moving out of Africa quite a lot this year, Nepal and India providing um, sanitary pads. A lot of the time what we do in that respect is we're teaching people how to make their own because while don donations of sanitary pads can be very um, useful, it's obviously not a long-term fix. So you've got things like Afri pads that we um, encourage people use and various other more sustainable approaches to getting girls back into the classroom um, during that time of the month. Food deliveries um, in Myanmar um, and in Europe, as I mentioned earlier, we have food packages to Romani families in Kosovo and Serbia. Also, um, one thing I just saw uh, yesterday as I was perusing the website was um, some kind of roof repairs for, um, in particular, it, it can just be families. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big project, an entire school. It could just be someone who is a humanist who lives in a part of the world where they don't have access to things we take for granted, they can contact the organization and, and if we um, you know, think it's a good cause, then they can potentially find funding. And that's all just down to the discretion of our donors. You know, we, we, we mail out, I'll, dis I'll discuss this a bit later, but we do these mail outs and then people can generally pick off what they like from a mail out and decide to support it. So quickly touch on the principles of humanist global charity. Humanism is obviously something that's, uh, you know, the unique selling point of the organization and everything that entails. So we're keen on female empowerment. We support various uh, women's groups, LGBT rights, global wealth um, distribution and freedom from religion, promotion of science and so on. Transparency. So whenever you donate within the organization, you're going to get a photo from the person or the group you've donated to. And um, generally it will be an accumulative thing where several people donate and then that person will get to set up their business or will get to rebuild a part of the school that's crumbling or something like that. But you get to see it as it develops. And if you want to stay in contact with the people you're assisting, that also can happen. Then sustainability, we are really aiming for long term prosperity, not just the individual handout, but that's why we like to support small enterprise, you know, get people the means to support themselves. Right, so that's pretty much the stuff that, you know, I, I, I go on the website, but essentially, and I speak to Hank, who is the director, so I have a bit of an insight, but that's not really what I'm doing for the most part. What I'm doing for the organisation is teaching thinking skills and encouraging well-being. In fact, this is the new approach to what I'm going to be doing for the organization, um, obviously just waiting on COVID to relax so I can get out to some countries. So the, the general plan is to do a five-day workshop in a school. I typically will come in a lunchtime, 
after school, if the school's really keen, I can do it within the school day. But I do sessions an hour and a half, two hours, looking at critical thinking on one day, uh, no, actually three days then, a day on nutrition and a day on encouraging um, sexual health. So the critical thinking, um, that's a concept that most of us are you know, fans of within humanism. And I put up uh, my definition there of what I take to be the essence of critical thinking. So just this idea that it's multidisciplinary skill set. We're really just taking all the good things out of these wide ranging subjects and producing a toolkit that learners can use to try and reason well and to find out what's true, what's false, and when they're ultimately being tricked by others who may be deceiving them, deceiving them knowingly, sometimes um, not even knowingly. It's just, you know, it's just the way, it's just what people believe and they pass it on to the next generation. So the three sessions I deliver when, when I'm in these schools and critical thinking, one I do is on belief and reasons. One is on evidence and superstition. And one is on um, the kind of threat of modern misinformation. Now, these things do vary quite a lot in how I deliver them because I have to adjust to the education levels of the schools that I'm teaching in. For example, as I said at the beginning when I was just chatting to the guys, at the moment I'm teaching in a, scar, a school in Jaipur in India, and those kids are very high level abilities. So we're focusing more on the kind of philosophical aspects of critical thinking, um, fallacies, reasoning, things like that. And not that many kids, to be fair, in this school believe in superstitions. So I will tend to focus on modern misinformation a bit more. But if I go to a place and I find that superstition is, is very uh, widespread there, then I'm going to uh, spend more time focusing on that, that aspect. So this first session we do is on foundations of beliefs, and that's just a bit of a philosophy crash course. This is a, that's actually at one of the humanist schools in um, Uganda, where I thought would be a good pay, good place to pilot the lessons. Really, we look at how various beliefs are justified. Do we justify the things we believe or the claims we make via faith, personal experience, authority, science, or reason? Students get to examine what those things mean. And for many of these kids, it's the first time they've actually explored where their beliefs have come from. And we look at the weaknesses for these various justifications. Now, when I was first teaching this, I did this in quite a balanced way where almost I'd be, you know, um, critiquing dimensions of reason <laughs> to the extent, you know, it's quite an advanced thought that you're going to get people to start to critique um, reason itself. What are the limits of reason? But really, I found that that was too advanced and I was maybe missing um, a teachable moment because most of the kids were believing that kind of faith and maybe authority of the things you should believe. And so when you give them a kind of false equivalence, you try and do it in a level way because you don't want to just look like you're um, telling people what to believe. You want to be presenting it like an exploration. Um, but I found that when I did start to say, well, these are the ways we can critique reason, it came across like I was saying, you know, science and reason are on equal footing to faith. So I've kind of adjusted how I'm teaching it now. And though I will say, look, all of these different areas of justification for belief have their weaknesses, their weaknesses are quite different and they're not evenly stacked. So for example, we might say that uh, the way to improve the weaknesses of science is of course through better science. That kind of logic doesn't apply in the case of faith, you don't get a true answer with faith by becoming more zealous in one's belief. Um, then our session, a session, um, our session switches to uh, question superstitions. We look at what kind of beliefs require strong evidence, and those are normally kind of paranormal, unusual beliefs that fall outside um, the realm of everyday human experience or what the scientific model confirms. And then we look at folk beliefs across the world. And that's really key to getting people to start to question their own unusual folk beliefs or superstitions. You give them one from China, you give them one from Britain, you give them one from a different historic context. And they start to see that really these things are just passed down by authority, by parents, by uh, charlatans, by witch doctors and so on for their own personal gain. So we really look at all that kind of stuff in the hope that we open up a little room for 
doubt. Then the final session on critical thinking is looking at all the myriad forms of misinformation that youngsters are exposed to via chiefly the internet, right? So most of these kids, even in rural Africa, are starting to have smartphones now, they're starting to get online. So this would be no different to what I teach my students in, in Britain, what I teach to these quite um, high ability kids in India at the moment. And so we're just looking at how internet sources of information misinform us, but also things like sensational documentaries, um, movies that claim to be based on true, uh, true facts or a real story and turn out to be completely uh, dishonest. Then we turn to nutrition, again with um, looking at African health trends, some of the problems that could emerge in the community, in particular with a switch to a Western diet or diets high in fats and sugar and so on. And we also look at foods that are healthy for the community, foods that are healthy for the environment, traditional diets, and apply to, applying critical thinking itself to all the food advertising that, um, uh, you know, Africa is replete with these companies going in and trying to manipulate people's often low level understanding of nutrition to try and sell um, dubious products. Then sex education, of course, is very important. Um, and this little um, graph on here kind of shows the efficacy of sex education compared to other options. Um, so it is important that we challenge ideas as they relate to sexual health and sex education. That could be anything from something like a female genital mutilation, um, just through to um, obviously safe sex, using condoms, uh, what are the various diseases and how do you catch them? So basically all those things you can see are things you'd want to teach if you want to promote a humanist perspective on human well-being. Now, one thing I do do, in which is the particular asset of me as a European guy going over there, of course, the optics often don't look good. The white guy standing at the front of an African class, you know, accusations of neo-colonialism or these types of things might pop up. But one benefit of me being the guy who comes from Europe is I get to bring uh, a suitcase full of things that will keep the kids interested. Maybe if, you know, this isn't something necessarily a 14 or 16 year old child in Africa is going to think, well, this is what I really need to be doing. So I try and take out any types of gifts, whether that's sports equipment, sanitary products for the, the girls, um, clothes, whatever. And at the end, we do a prize giving for the kids who've completed the course. How am I doing for time, by the way? Yeah, that's fine. Just keep going, Dan. Yeah. Um, training, whilst I'm out there, I will try and train local educators because I can really only afford to go to a country because I pay for my flights most of the time off my own back with a, a small kind of stipend from the charity, perhaps, but it's really, it, it wouldn't even cover my, my costs. So most of the time I like to get out there, train someone up locally, give them the resources, give them what they need in order to deliver it. And hopefully the charity can then pay them to go around and deliver the workshop. Um, but you know, this stuff is fairly new in educational settings. So making sure it's done right and we have a solid uh, foundation for what we're teaching is also important. Um, and now just a couple of pictures from my, my last project. I was actually out with my school that I work with in Britain. Um, I was out with the British Council doing a project on zero hunger with a school in Ghana, but I stay an extra week and went to an Islamic school in Accra and you know it's quite an, an impoverished school I would say not particularly good um, resources and what have you I was teaching about probably I don't know about 70 kids at a time in a classroom but they really took to it they really enjoyed it um, I was fortunate the head teacher there studied um, philosophy I think at university and he was keen to get the kids on board with critical thinking um, so yeah that was a fruitful few days and they, they really enjoyed it Right, okay, so yeah, that's just a, just a picture, one, one picture of one of the, the um, critical thinking classes. I won't go into all the stuff I've done, but I generally stick up a lot of stuff on, on Twitter, or I will be once COVID allows me to get out there again. So turning to the part where, you know, why I'm going out to various humanist, humanist organisations in the UK is to kind of drum up support, raise awareness for what we're doing, 
we do typically around four, four to six fundraising campaigns a year where we send out an email with our various projects on it. And essentially what people can do is just subscribe to that. You get the email I and mean, then you just see something that might resonate with you. It might be that there's a girl in Nigeria who's been chucked out of her family. She's a humanist, but she wants to go to university. If that's what you want to support, that's what you can support. If you think, oh, no, I want to actually put money towards uh, this business initiative for this uh, women's collective of humanists, then you can um, put your money in that direction as well. So it's just up to you what you pick. Um, but now we've also added a monthly donation option. So if you just want to set up a kind of standing order where, you know, 10 pounds or whatever goes out of your bank account um, and you just feel can feel good about doing that and know it's going to reach um, various organizations, but very uh, various organizations within Africa who are doing the work, then we can set that up as well. Um, so yeah, essentially all we need is people's email addresses. So if any of you are happy to give an email address, you can chuck them in the chats uh, and I can do a screen um, dump of those or copy those into our mailing list or maybe uh, David could send me those at a later date if you do want to get involved in any way. And oh, this picture on the PowerPoint is just showing you how the cart system works where essentially it's like buying a pair of shoes or whatever online. You find the thing you, you want to support and you just say, well, it might say 10 pounds. So if you add two quantity two, that's gonna take 20 pounds and it goes to whoever you want to support. Then you're gonna receive a picture and maybe a thank you letter from whoever you've decided to support. Um, and so those are our contacts for any of you who are on Twitter. Um, you can add me if you want to see if you want to see me uh, upload pictures when I start doing stuff and videos of when I'm teaching within various classrooms, or if you just want to see what the organization as a whole is doing in the next few uh, months, uh, then you can add Humanist Global. But the website is probably the best place to just see a comprehensive list of everything we're doing. So that's if you just Google Humanist Global Charity, you will find us on there. I think that pretty much takes me to the end. I may have rushed through it. I don't know. I don't know the kind of, oh yeah, that's half an hour. That's perfect. So yeah. So that's pretty much me done on my talk. So I can kind of just turn to any questions people have now. That's great. Thank you very much, Dan. Well, I've, I've certainly got plenty of questions, but uh, let's see if other people have questions first. Um, that's definitely given us a a good overview of the organisation and your involvement as well. Um, so if people would like to ask a question, um, conventionally, it's easier if you can find the blue hand symbol and then I can easily sort of uh, get to you in order. Or if you want to sort of wave at me on the screen, um, I can try and get to you as well that way. But sometimes I miss people if they're just waving at me. So, um, Aaron, we, we've got a question from you straight away. So go ahead, Aaron. You're usually first in the queue. So uh, you go ahead. <laughs> I, I usually am. Um, yes, a number of us are part of Humanistically Speaking, which is a magazine going out to loads of people. Um, hopefully, David would support this. That If you were to write uh, an 800 word article with, say, four pictures, we could put that in and then that could go out to as many people as we could send it to several thousand potentially if they all read um so would be would that be okay do you think david we could put that in somewhere that that would be really good and just just for dan's um information we've just done an interview with leo igwe in nigeria so that you know it might be possible to sort of link those two things together but we'll you know certainly in, in one way we'd love to give more um publicity to this this charity definitely Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Any help is welcome. Any suggestions are welcome. One thing I've been discussing a bit with Hank in the organisation is, you know, what one thing I would quite like to see across countries in the kind of um, what high income countries, essentially, in the West, is it would, I think, be quite nice if various branches um, twinned with various places. This isn't something we've developed as an idea in, in much detail, but you know, it would be good to say that, you know, uh, 
Dorset humanists, you twin with, it could be anywhere in the world, but ideally in a low income country and say, there's a connection there. People exchange ideas, they have a social meet, but there's also something that really, you know, builds a sense of international humanist community. So that's something I'll be considering as well, um, which, you know, I can get back to you guys on if that interests anyone in the organization. We did have a, an informal um, relationship with a, a humanist school in northern India, yeah. uh, and, but unfortunately the, the, the director died a few years ago and the connection is, is much weaker now. But, um, but yeah, just to let you know that we have yeah. definitely been involved in that kind of thing in the past. So. Yeah. Okay, um, let's go to Gary. Gary, what's your question or comment? Um, hi, Dan. Um, thanks for doing the great work there. And uh, it's interesting to hear about it. Um, my question is, um, how would you respond to someone of um, in a sort of moral human, oh, sorry, um, a moral relativist uh, sort of perspective? So that they, um, they say, oh, uh, you know, morals are just a, uh, Culture, you know, culturally specific, and you know, each place to their own, and that sort of uh, logic. Thank you. Okay, so well, surprisingly, those aren't very often the types of questions one gets when delivering the workshop <laughs> itself. Uh, these, you know, concerns about uh, you know relativity, postmodernism, and as I was kind of hinting at earlier, the stuff about like neo-colonialism and these these types of concerns that we certainly have as we're thinking through some of these these concepts of you know kind of uh, humanist missionary work then the people on the ground generally don't tend to have those or don't articulate them very much um maybe they're just yeah I'm, I'm trying to think of a context where that's come up now obviously one can just go if i'm just addressing the question as it is um you can obviously just become philosophically smug and do all these things about uh, relativism being uh, self-defeating and start going into that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure how useful that would be on the ground with someone who's saying, well, this is my particular tradition. Um, all you can do, I would suspect in that context, moving away from being kind of philosophically smug, is just try and emphasize the fact that, you know, the things I'm talking about within the sessions I am delivering about innate human abilities, the ability to reason. So you can adopt that approach. You can say that I'm just bringing out skills that you clearly have, every human being has these innately. And if that doesn't work, you can talk about kind of humanism within African traditions and say it's not, not so foreign. Um, for example, Leo would probably be the best person to sp uh, speak to about that, you know, the traditions in Africa of Ubuntu and stuff like this. So when it comes to imparting humanism, there are several kind of routes you can take to push back against a kind of relativism about superstition. Um, but I generally find most people do at some level think promoting false things and promoting things that cause harm is bad and it doesn't take too much to tease that out of people with gentle questioning. We're not storming in there as critical thinkers and going, believe this, believe this. We're kind of opening up people's minds and then they reflect on it and then we go away. It's not, it's, you know, to call it humanist missionary work would be uh, unfair, I think. We're not, we're not telling people, believe this. Um, we're teaching skills to question and think and what people do with that is up to them if it leads them to humanism great but uh, you know I, I don't I think questioning can be part of any uh, intellectual and cultural tradition um, so that's I don't know if that answers the question no, it's um, a great answer and uh, thanks for taking the time no worries thanks very much Gary uh, let's go to Gail next Gail what's your question hi good evening Dan um, just following on pretty well from um, Gary's question have you ever felt personally under any threat from any religious groups um, who are not happy about you being there? No, not yet, not yet. So the, the, the only thing I've had where it w which could be classified as pushback is when I was um, going to distribute condoms 
in a school in Kenya and they felt that that kind of violated their mores too strongly. So they weren't keen on that idea, but um, yeah, so we just had to say, you have to, you know, it's wise to use a condom, but I couldn't be seen mm -hmm. to be encouraging that kind of thing. But again, as I was saying earlier, well, it's, it's kind of a bit hard in some sense, and that we do focus maybe more on superstition than religion. And given that, uh, given that many of the schools are uh, Christian or Islamic in nature, they kind of almost see that as a common enemy. Um, so they don't really mind it if I'm bashing on something a bit, you know, like a, a local superstition or something like that. Um, I rarely, I rarely say, oh, here's a tenet of Christianity. Uh, let's examine this. Let's see if it stands up to scrutiny. But I definitely do show the weaknesses of faith is an approach to forming beliefs. That's as strong as what we're saying really goes. It's not, you know, so compared again to Christian missionaries who in the past have gone out and said you'll burn in hell if you don't believe this doctrine or whatever, then what we're offering is actually quite tame. Um, yes, I, I um, it was more not so much the people attending, but people not attending, right. um, local religious groups and things like that. I just wondered if you ever ran into any feelings yeah. that you were in danger. We're definitely not, or I'm certainly not high profile enough to even be on the radar. Say, say I've got a friend in Ghana or a friend in Nigeria. He finds me a school that, that's fairly local. Um, he might be friends with one of the teachers there. I'm in there for a week. I'm out, I'm back in England. No one's no one's the wise, really. So, uh, no. If I did get to a point of notoriety, hey, who's this punk going around uh, all across Nigeria teaching our children that you know faith is not the best way to come to uh, beliefs? Then, yeah, I might find myself in some hot water, but I certainly don't see see that happening anytime soon. That kind of level of uh, awareness of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. So, Dan, you, you said that you, you do actually visit Christian schools and, and Muslim schools. That, that's quite surprising in a way. Um, they're fairly open to, to having someone from a humanist charity. Most of them don't know what humanism is and wouldn't, wouldn't have the foggiest. <laughs> right. So I, I would just say I'm okay. teaching... T teaching uh, I would generally, well, I won't be deceptive. I will say I work for Humanist Global Charity. We promote uh, reason, science, um, uh, rationality, these kind of words I would use. Um, yeah. We'll do a workshop, um, also a bit on sex ed, also a bit on nutrition. Does that sound like something you'd be interested in? That's mm. pretty much the pitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, but yeah, I'm, I'm at the early stages of doing this, so I don't have... I don't really have a history of saying I've been to uh, 100 schools. I've done it in three, three in total in Africa, one in India. Um, and so that's it. I'm teaching it a bit in the UK. So I yeah. was picking up steam and then COVID hit. And so that pretty much, uh, you know, left me in a situation not being able to do any of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, look, people, I'll, I'll carry on asking questions, but if any, anyone uh, has a question occur to them, then just, just chip in, uh, wave at me or stick the blue hand up. But I, I did jot down quite a number of questions as you were going through, Dan. Um, I think, yeah, the, the idea of promoting humanism, um, it sounds as though that's very much a kind of, if it happens at all, it's very much in the background, a kind of indirect kind of thing. Um, so you're not actually out there to promote humanism as such as a worldview, but it's it's the it's the science, the critical thinking, and all the, those other things that make up humanism. But <laughs> yeah, the, the thin um, the thin end of the wedge, I think. Yeah, we you know you could maybe combine something like this in the foreseeable future with the humanist school speakers program that, that's going around UK schools. Yeah. <clears throat> Obviously, they're not really, in a sense, promoting humanism. They're being informative about humanism. Yeah, yeah. That will attract people who are so inclined. One day we might get to that point where we can go around countries in the Middle East and Africa doing that. But we're certainly not at that point. So it's a, a very gradual process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, 
You mentioned albino children, and, and that, I've sort of noticed that um, before in terms of witchcraft and stuff like that in Africa. Is there a greater incidence of albinism in, in Africa, would you say, or, or, is, or is it just, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if that is... I, um, I don't have the foggiest. I don't know whether it's the fact that they're more conspicuous because of obviously the black hair yeah. is it's going to stand out way more, or whether whether yeah. I, I literally know nothing about uh, 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 you know the, what causes this condition. All I know mm. is that when you know it's called, if someone tells me it's caused by a curse or that a child deserves to be uh, ostracised, that they're you know completely wrong. But yeah, yeah. I, you, you've probably got someone within the organisation who knows a bit more on that than, than I do. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Lisa and Richard, um, what's your, go ahead, Lisa, what's your question? Hello there, uh, thanks ever so much for that, Dan. I really enjoyed that very much. And uh, it's very heartwarming to think of you going out and doing those things. Um, really, I, I just wanted to know um, if you met with much resistance to your ideas in the classroom, because um, I think for children who haven't had uh, that type of critical thinking, understanding, or had a very, very narrow exposure of ideas, um, it, must, it must be difficult for some of them to grasp the concepts, yeah, or do yeah. you feel that they're sort of open and sponges? You're going to get a mixture within the classroom. You're going to get some children who you're going to get some children who just want to please Mr. Teacher, and then so they're going to give me the answer I want to hear. You're going to get some who this is completely baffling. You're going to get some. You know, I've I've done I've I've given a class where we're looking at the as I was saying the five typical ways that you could justify a belief or justify a claim, and having given like a really you know, really laid into them on the fact that, you know, faith is perhaps not, you know, it's got these problems or the flaws with personal experience in terms of how biases can emerge, how one can be deceived and so on by one's own personal experience. I can give quite a lot of context to all of that stuff. And then a child will still, when we do an activity at the end, which would be a kind of plenary activity of the kids sharing their views on uh, which reason or what justification they think is the strongest, you still will get a kid put his hand up and go, faith is the most important way to form a belief. Obviously, I've got limited time. Some people are going to believe that to the day they die. Uh, people in Britain I've met think that way. So again, we're, we're, this, we're at a very early stage of presenting these ideas within uh, schools in particular in places like Africa. So you take the small victories and I've certainly seen kids come around to the ideas and if you can get them to think about superstitions on a small like maybe there's a superstition that isn't even a harmful one a superstition that isn't particularly harmful but you say that well it's just come down through authority um, and then they come away and they start to think well yeah how much of what I do believe at the minute is just a matter of hearing it from my parents they might not even express that at home to their parents or start to talk back to their parents but they might have a bit of hesitation on what they actually believe. And I guess that's the, the hope we, uh, that's what we hope for in, in delivering the class. Thank you. But the kids, one thing I would say is kids in, in terms of resistance, you're not gonna get hostility among, this, these kids are very well behaved. And in many ways, that's a bit of a challenge in Africa. It's the level of, it, okay, I've only probably taught in about six schools in Africa but just going by my own personal experience as justifying my own belief as flawed as that may be, working from anecdote, Africa, and this is what I hear from most of my African friends and family and what have you, African children are generally much better behaved and much more obsequious to their teacher. If there is a notion of, you go into most classrooms, it's very much, I'm the teacher, I'm telling you what to believe, you write it down. So that can work in my favor when I'm delivering the stuff but at the same time, that's kind of something you want to challenge. You want them to, you want them to accept legitimate authority, but not just authority on its own. So scientific authority is okay in some contexts, but just trusting someone because they're a witch doctor, a priest, a mullah, uh, or a bad parent even is a bad idea. So we've got to try and balance those those things. Uh, 
I'm going to just put in the in the chat about um, the sort of common superstitions that you might find in in the UK, and uh, it would be quite interesting to know, Dan, whether there are any examples of superstitions that you've come across in Africa that are. Yeah, well, they're really uh, perhaps not quite as trivial as touching oh, yeah. touching wood and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, they really do run the full gamut from the kind of trivial things that constitute superstitions typically within the UK. Um, for example, in Ghana, there's a belief that if you see a shooting star, someone has just died. So that would be a harmless superstition. You can have beneficial superstitions, such as in Morocco, there's this thing called um, the sleeping the sleeping baby belief, which is this idea that if a woman is pregnant and the husband hasn't been, hasn't been around for uh, months and months within a period where she could have, um, could have got pregnant by her husband, obviously she's slept with someone else, but this, this particular superstition is quite a, quite a beneficial one because it enables the woman not to end up getting divorced or uh, beaten by her husband. So in some rare cases, a superstition can have some benefit. Then you've just got really weird sexist superstitions. Women can grow beards if they if they eat uh, meat, stuff like that, um, goat meat, um, Fanta. Any girl who drinks Fanta is uh, promiscuous. That's one of the weird ones. Um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Fanta would right. make me believe that. Uh, Ableism of various kinds of, you know, things to do with disabled, oh well, one I saw even on the front page of a newspaper when I was in Ghana last was that um, epilepsy is caused by demonic possession. Um, you've got things like mm. you shouldn't fish on certain days of the week because there are sea monsters that will get you, so that's just a counterproductive superstition. And then things like mm. marg that lead to something really quite morally serious, like marginalisation. You've probably seen stuff about uh, witch children. There's a charity, I think they used to be called, I don't know if they're still around, Stepping Stones, Nigeria, uh, not connected to us. They used to do a lot of work helping children who've been uh, labelled as witches, who then get, they, sometimes they get killed, other times they just get blamed for all sorts of things. And then right through to lethal superstitions, as I mentioned, albinos can be hunted and hacked to pieces for their mm. body parts. So the thing with superstition is we can mm. often quite have a, a non-charged uh, conversation about the mundane ones, like walking under a ladder, you'll get bad luck and hope that mm. they see the link between those types of things and the more serious things. But mm. obviously, if I'm in a class and I were to see people express ideas like, um, you know, demonic possession. I try and correct them with the scientific information as well as giving them critical thinking skills. Yeah. Okay, that was a fascinating, fascinating number of different uh, superstitions there. Um, Dan, just, just to satisfy my curiosity, you mentioned a popsicle machine in the presentation. I have no idea what that is. Should I know what that is? Um, well, no, I, I don't know what it is, to be honest. I guess it's oh, right, okay. <laughs> that they then sell. Um, but yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't involved with that one. So um, that would be something you might have to look up on, okay. the, on the website. But I think well, there are ice lollies. So it's yeah. presumably a machine that makes ice oh, lollies. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sally. That's a popsicle. Yeah. 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 Like that could be as, as little as uh, providing a freezer ingredients to set up a business a little stand that someone could have where they sell popsicles in the community or whatever but if it, yeah. if it gets them a livelihood you know the things that people build a livelihood around in many african countries that i've uh, traveled to you know you'll be surprised you know what's your job i sell popcorn you know i stayed with a woman once in a i uh, rented out her house while i was staying in kenya and that, that was her job so but she had a popcorn machine. She needed the investment for that. So if an mm -hmm. organization could provide it, then you've given someone a source of income, as humble yeah. as it may be by the likes of many Westerners. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Gary, what's your next question? Thank you. Um, I was going to ask, um, where do you see the sort of priority or the, or even in fact, um, do you see it as happening? Um, the idea of 
uh, promoting humanism in first world countries as well, such as the United States, which has got um, a dodgy record on how it treats its um, atheists uh, and humanists. I, yeah, ultimately, I, I believe in prioritizing the um, you know, emerging economies and emerging countries of the world, given how one large their populations are, how much bang um, for a buck we get as an organization there, and also free the fact that in, um, say, the United States of America, there it's replete with atheist organizations, humanist organizations. They're doing that work and they've got to carry on and doing it. But um, I would like to see more of those organizations turn their gaze um, to the Middle East, to Africa and places where even though it can be, uh, you know, tough for humanists, um, it's nowhere near as tough as it would be uh, elsewhere. Thanks. OK, thanks, Gary. Um, Dan, about you did mention a bit about funding and, and donations and that kind of thing, but I'm I'm imagining that given the scale of the operation in so many different countries, it sounds as though, in my mind, it sounds as though it's a well-funded American organisation with with some very wealthy donors. I, I mean, I don't know if that's. Mm. Uh, is, is, I, I wouldn't say so. We've got a couple of donors who are give us a, a generous um, payment, but I think. As far as I'm, I understand it, I don't do our accounts or anything like that, but we are picking up funding from just individual humanists, um, people like right. yourselves. Um, generally, the campaigns that go out, most of, we do have quite a lot of success with what does go out, um, but obviously the need is constantly growing. The more humanism is, is getting greater exposure, the more people are choosing to um, adopt that philosophy and they obviously find themselves in need of aid in these various countries so it's constantly growing but yeah we do we do rely on um, small donors quite a lot okay. uh, like me personally I, the way I'm looking at it is Hank the director of organization is very much with me he's like what you've got to do is get people in the UK aware of the organization, but also encourage people to fund the work that you're doing. The more people right. you talk to who are willing to fund the educational side of mm. what we're doing, then that frees up the money that I've got in my, you know, available so that I can help with some of the other things, whether that's business startups, funding uh, someone's education, um, building schools and so on, those kind of things. Whereas I'm more you can, again, I don't like the comparison. It's a poor comparison, but if you look at what I'm doing as kind of educational missionary work, I'm going out there trying to change the minds, which is a, a hard task to some, to some degree, as opposed to, and it's hard to see the palpable progress. If you fund someone's popsicle machine, you see the popsicle machine, right? What I'm doing is a little harder to gauge the progress of how it is working, but it just needs... The more people are doing it, the more critical thinking is applauded within educational settings. The more people are exposed to it, hopefully we can start to build a, a context in which humanist ideas can begin to flourish. So when it comes to funding, he is, he, he is quite keen for me to, to, to encourage, he, he's keen for me to persuade people to donate a little to the critical thinking side of it. Although there are so many great things going on in the organization but I myself end up spending some of my money to fund some of the great things coming mm -hmm. up because they just, you know, you can't resist when you see the plight of a girl in, uh, say, a mother in Sudan who's got three disabled children and she needs, I'm just giving a hypothetical here, but she needs help to set up a business. If I see that, I'm going to want to give to it. Um, but yeah, so all I'd say is if you want to, if you want to donate to what I'm doing, that's great. But if other things appeal to you as well those right there at the and, and Dan if we if we went to the website and um we would see um critical thinking for example as a funding stream yeah. or, or would we actually see um a direct link to you let's fund what Dan is doing specifically so yeah so hang on a sec I'll just open our website and share my screen with you Right. 
right, I'll just take you guys through the website and make sure it's all uh, running nicely. Thanks. So onto, onto here, you can see all the various things were um, involved in here. Yeah. Freedom from religion, education-based stuff, um, entrepreneurship, women's groups, LGBT. And then when you go into donate here, various right. things pop up. Um, I don't know if mine's, is mine even on here at the minute? Because we do, basically what we do is funding funding cycles. So certain things will come up on a monthly basis. You see this donate strip here, yeah. that rotates. So you're not always gonna see the same things come up. So what's here is prioritizing mm. what we're doing this month. Now, okay. at the moment I'm fully funded in terms of what I need to do my next kind of three or four projects in different countries. Okay. Because I've been around doing this for, for to various organizations within the UK. But once that funding drops down again, then what you'll see is me pop up on that donate strip probably. So yeah. obviously I've not been able to do anything for a year plus because of uh, COVID. So you'll see me pop up there, but you will find me somewhere on here. It's just a matter of searching. I'm just trying to see. It'll probably be under the education section. Okay. Um, There's a lot of a lot of tabs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Human well-being and thinking skills for schools. So I think I came. Yeah. So yeah. here it's a bit of a write-up of what I do. If you want a bit more detail, and then. Once you've read through that, there should normally be a donate or, oh yeah, donate here. You can oh, go to- Oh, right, okay. So there's a different place there. Yeah, so, but obviously I'm not prioritized because I've reached my funding. Right. But, um, okay, that's people. handy. But then, yeah, I'll obviously in a few months probably come up there after I've done some workshops. But bear in yeah. mind, I'm probably paying for over 50% or 60%, I would say, of my travel expenses and just living while I'm there mm. myself, just because it's a hobby for me. But obviously right. I'd love to get to a point where it wasn't, <laughs> where, yeah, I, yeah. where I got paid to do it fully. But then as well, all I want to do is hit one country once and then pay someone else to do it. I don't have the time or the money to be going to Ghana eight times a year to teach in eight schools in Ghana when someone from mm. Ghana can just do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Um, Aaron, do you want to go again? Yes, following on from that topic, I was just wondering if you could give us a, a ballpark figure of what the cost would be for one of your outing trips. Oh gosh, so typically... Probably hundreds, uh, thousands, tens of thousands? Yeah, so I'm probably, I, say I go to Ghana, I might, if I'm lucky, get a flight for £500. Um, I will probably spend, so I just do one week in one school, obviously that's not, I try and stay two weeks um, to do two schools. Um, different year groups within that school but yeah 500 pound on the flight visa alone to get into Ghana is about 150 quid I think then um, staying there is going to cost me 500 pounds while I'm there and then the money I get from Humanist Global would be 300 dollars roughly as a you know a stipend for what I'm doing just to offset the cost but as you can see <laughs> that doesn't add up to too much out of that money that I'm spending Okay. So, yeah. but in fact, and this raises another point, anyone else who likes traveling to Africa and likes education and wants to do this, especially if your teacher trained, you've done all your safeguarding, your uh, all those kind of things, then, all, yeah, I'm very happy to give the resources and to train the people in the UK who also um, want to deliver it. It's too big a task for one man and too big a cost for one guy. I only started doing it because I thought it'd be a cool hobby. Um, but yeah, it's obviously very expensive. Okay. Thank you very much. And Dan, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the how contacts are made. I, it sounded as though you or the organisation has got various contacts in, in countries. Are these humanist organisations in these various countries? Is that a kind of starting point or? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you've got the Humanist Association of Ghana, Nigeria. And so I will just speak. Right people through the Facebook groups, make friends, um, and so on. Uh, there, there's really quite a wide network, um, though it obviously represents a tiny fraction of the population 
of a country like Nigeria, the people are there, they are organized. When I was in Ghana la last time, I went to a couple of their kind of LGBT um, events and what have you there, but were being, you know, those are generally quite a good meeting point for progressives and humanists and what have you. So you just meet people through there. And then every, you know, most people who live in West Africa, they're gonna know this person, they're gonna know that person. And between, between you, you're gonna be able to find someone who knows someone in a school who's willing to let me come in and do the teaching. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and could you say, a little, I know we discussed this um, before, I think probably by email, but could you say a little bit about the contrast uh, or the complementarity of Humanist Global Charity and Humanist International? Yeah, so obviously many people get that quite confused at times. Um, I'd say we're more kind of grassroots helping very small um, groups or collectives or even individuals. Whereas I'd say, I don't want to speak for Humanist International, they're an organization I do, you know, I support them through a monthly payment and what have you. Um, but they, how I tend to look at them, I don't know if they'd agree, I tend to look at them as more about um, more of a kind of think tank or an advocacy group. They're going to take on things like um, legal fees for people who've come up on a come up on a blasphemy charge or something like that. They're going to do a lot of the public relations work. We as an organization are not going to spend large sums of money on that kind of thing when we can feed, you know, 30 orphans for the same, you know, we can feed in a whole school for the price that they're spending on those things. That someone's doing it, that someone's dealing with the public relations side, that's good as far as I'm concerned. Um, mm. But we're doing two quite different things, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And also they do quite a lot of conferences. We're not gonna fly people out to conferences or whatever. We're not mm. going to do much of that kind of hobnobbing. I, I would love one day if we could get everyone from Humanist Global in a room, but that would probably be off our own backs funding-wise. So, Yeah. We're yeah. very much yeah. following the principles of Peter Singer in the life you can save in terms of uh, effective altruism. So we, we try to be very careful with the pennies we spend. Okay, that's, that's actually quite an interesting link you've just made because, yeah, we've, we've done, I mean, years ago, we actually had a, an event based around Peter Singer's book, The Life You Can Save. So, yeah, that's quite interesting just to link to that as a, an underlying ethical philosophy. That's yeah, most, uh, most charities are starting to, uh, you know, adopt those, those principles, I'd hope anyway. So, um, but yeah, one, so that differentiates us from Humanist International. And then I guess another thing people might be interested in as well, why actually help a humanist organisation? And I'd say... The difference with us is, you know, you can help your your Oxfams or any of these groups. I don't know who is rated quite highly. I forget the kind of list, but someone like Peter Singer provides. I can remember he ranks somewhere like the Against Malaria Foundation very highly. But some of the household names, I don't think they come up that high on the rating of kind of mm. mm. But one, re one reason why you might want to... To be honest, I support quite a few different organisations in terms of just transfer goes out my my bank account, as probably most many of you people do as, as well. But what we're offering is actually helping, you know, helping our humanist brethren and also dealing with the educational side about championing, yeah. ch promoting, championing those humanist values. You know, uh, Oxfam, Action Aid, they're, they're helping people, they're doing great work, no doubt but they're not uh, obviously trading in uh, the currency of ideas in the same way that we would be. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a very big selling point, I think, for, for humanists. And um, just, uh, just one more point, and then I'll let Sally come in. Um, you mentioned the humanist schools in Uganda, so it sounds as though you've got good links with them as well. Yeah, and that kind of ties into uh, an aspect of our philosophy. We go into an area where the humanists aren't perhaps well connected, where the funding isn't there. What we want to do is go in there, if it means building a school, as we did in Uganda, then find another organization that wants to take on that funding. So that then we can move into another country where there aren't so many connections and get that one going, whether that's somewhere like the DRC or somewhere like Ivory Coast, or even 
thinking in the future of the Caribbean. That's an area we haven't really explored, but is in need of, I think, kind of humanist work. Okay, so you were, you were there, you, you did some quite substantial work for the Ugandan humanist schools in the early days, would you say? Or, or yes, recently? yeah, so um, I think if you, there's a few different organisations now. Um, I've forgotten the name, um, is it the, uh, the Uganda, I'm trying to remember the name of the... I mean, one, yeah, one of, one of our members, I think, is a trustee of the Ugandan Humanist Schools Trust. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, so yeah. they would have, um, I think they run one of the very schools we built. I'm not 100% sure on, the, on this. You'd probably have to check some of these. Okay. Details, Hank, yeah. as I wasn't with the organisation when all that stuff was going on. Okay. Okay, that, that's really interesting, that link. Thank you. Let's bring Sally in. Sally, what's your question? Well, I was very interested, Dan, that... Uh, it seemed to be that uh, uh, so far from being employed by um, humanist global charity in the sense of actually getting money for, for from them, you were you were putting a lot of your own mm. money into doing that work. Um, I was wondering about the the other people. I mean, it, you, you see it's based in America, from what you were saying. I, how how many employees do do they have that are sort of full time pa paid employees? Um, oh, gosh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I'd be hesitant to say any. Yes. Uh, the nature of the, the organization seems, as far as I'm aware, but again, I don't want to misspeak if this is incorrect, but there's lots of people doing stuff on the side like me, as far as I can see. Even Hank, the director, is probably doing a lot of it voluntarily. So there's lots of people within the organization. We have, for example, um, boards of advisors. We've got interns, people who are um, contributing articles to the website, people who are helping out, but it really is just very thin on the ground when it comes to what you call employed staff. So that yeah. might be another area where we're massively different to these bigger uh, charities where, you know, if I said I was working for Roxfam, you'd expect that I had a salary, right? That I was able to live off yeah. the work mm. that I'm doing. Whereas for me, it has it has to be a hobby. Uh, I, I don't know whether I don't know whether the, the organisation would ever move to a point where it could pay uh, salaries like that. I, I would. I, I'm very, very. I find it very, very refreshing indeed that it is like that because mm. um, I've I've been really cheesed off the the huge you know com particularly compared to the areas they're working in the huge salaries paid to people um, uh, at the top of of these big charities mm -hmm. and it's absolutely scandalous i've worked for many years um um low in the local amnesty group and we were just horrified to say you know to discover uh, at one point what the people were being paid at the top and that a huge severance payment was given to someone they wanted to get rid of and it yeah. seems so wrong um yeah. that the people who are trying to help have got nothing and, and you know they're they're you're going into those people are going into charity work as a sort of business and expecting to be paid the sort of things that they would be paid in the business world. Um, I guess there's two schools of thought on that. So yeah, I very much mm -hmm. understand the sentiment and people apply a different level of um, kind of scepticism, I feel, with charities and how they spend their money considering they're not getting anything in return as opposed to when you buy a pair of trainers. On the other hand, if a charity by employing someone full-time makes more money for the causes, I'd be in favour of it. And that, I think, would be in a principle of, you know, effective altruism. If having... Oh, oh I'm not against them being pay, paid, you know, a living wage living, in yeah. principle if the charity is big enough for them to, to need the people to do, do the work there. But um, uh, as I'm saying, you know, the thought of charity as big business revolts me. And... Um, um, so, you know, I, I look very favourably on um, the humanist global charity because it seemed to be so different. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we welcome volunteers. So if any of you have a particular skill set, by all means, get in contact. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK. And Dan, I, I, this is slightly personal, but I just wondered if you could say a little bit about your experience uh, getting married in, in Africa. Is that something you could tell us a little bit about? 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, my partner is uh, Kenyan. Um, and yeah, we decided just on a, a humanist wedding, as neither of us are religious, obviously, humanist uh, ourselves. So in terms of the dynamic of it, it wasn't particularly unusual. We just had a ceremony on the beach, um, a guy called uh, Kato, uh, who does quite a lot of humanist work, a, f a friend from Uganda, he came and um, he came read a poem. Uh, we had a celebrant, a uh, Kenyan humanist celebrant who uh, did our, our vows and what have you. And then, yeah, it was just, just a party, uh, just a party afterwards. So there was nothing particularly, you know, unusual. We had to go to a registry office separately so right. you know, it's, it's quite standard really yeah okay okay um no one was particularly surprised even but i don't think although my best man uh my best man gave a big speech in which he uh, um fortunately i don't think many of the people there understood his english most you know most people <laughs> but he was going yeah. through all sorts of blasphemous stuff well not bla not blasphemy but just being very blunt on uh my atheism, for example, in his best men's speech, which I'm sure if they did hear it would have shocked a few people who in the crowd wouldn't have been themselves mm. atheists. So. Mm. <laughs> and, and Aaron has just asked whether the marriage is recognised in the UK, the marriage that you contracted there. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's official. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. It would just be, what we had is the same as going to a registry office in the UK. Yeah, two yep. separate ceremonies. Well, I, I'm sure it's the same here, right, at the moment. It is, yeah, still um, until it changes. <laughs> okay, well, um, any more questions from anyone? We can uh, start thinking about wrapping up. But Dan, you've given us a really good um, overview of the charity. I. I don't think I'd really heard of it until you contacted me. So it's it's great to know uh, more yeah, about yeah. it. And I think you've given a really positive view of what's going on. And particularly, as Sally was just saying, you know, that it's just really nice to know that we can we can give to something that, that you know, feels humanist and something that is not, not some kind of giant organisation, which is uh, paying huge salaries and all the rest of it. So... Sounds yeah, as though you're doing great work. Of, in terms of the kind of straightforward, you know, the education side I'm dealing with, that's opening minds in a kind of more philosophical way. But if you think about yeah. the, the, the warming of hearts that goes on when people start to see that philanthropy is being done under the banner of of humanism, that people are saying, well, what's this word, humanism? Yeah. Oh, people believe that I want to help you because you're, you know, a fellow human being and you're in need as opposed yeah. to, you know, some, you know, religious motivation or otherwise. And it's really, really helpful when we, you know, for, in, for example, if we go into schools in the UK and people might say, well, what are humanists doing? You know, you've got Christian aid, what do humanists do? Well, actually, now we can say, well, you know, there's humanist global charity and, and it's really good to be able to say that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so spread the word. If you feel like donating to uh, myself or any of the other causes within the organisation, we'd hugely appreciate that. And yeah, thank you all for, for hearing me out. Well, Dan, Dan we also do, um, uh, we have a winter appeal every year. And uh, I can see Aaron in the, in the chat as maybe just to me, but he's already mentioned that this is something we might want to put to our members as a, as a possibility. So uh, we'll certainly certainly give it some further thought. Okay, and, and as I said, yeah, any emails you want to fling on to me um, afterwards, I can collect those and just add them to our mailing list so you can see see what we're up to. That's Dan, funny. could you just put the link into the chat of that page with you on there? I've I, I yes. just on the website now, I couldn't find it. Right, I think I went into the education section, did I? 
Yeah, I got a bit lost on the website as well. Uh, I thought. No, it wasn't there. Um, one second. Um, it was the page that had um, Maslow's triangle. That's, I think you meant you, you probably noticed that, Aaron, didn't you? Maslow's I didn't triangle. Notice that, actually, but it was it, oh, it, it, it had all your stuff on there, and I thought that'd be yeah, good yeah. To, as a brief. Yeah, we've got to find it. Oh, it's got Maslow's triangle. I think Maslow's triangle. Even, even better, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think though, though those um, the, the discussion, the whole criteria of your talk would be great to do in the schools talk. But I'm guessing British schools have such a tight curriculum that school speakers would have trouble getting that in. Yeah, probably, you know, probably. I do as much as I can within my school. But you know, I, my my dream at one stage was to be doing this full time to be able to get funding from local boroughs to go around giving workshops to schools. It probably wouldn't include the sexual education. We're, we're fine on that front, I think, in the UK. <laughs> Sex ed, nutrition, I don't need to be doing that, but just critical thinking, especially off the back of co uh, COVID with the poor vaccine uptakes and so on. I really yeah. thought the boroughs that I contacted would be keen to have someone like me go around and get, get students on board with critical thinking, but I didn't yeah. know. Mm. So Dan, are you able to put that link in before we wrap up? I think up? I checked it in the chat. So it should be. Oh, I think it's just gone to John. Hang on, let me put it into everyone. Have you been having a private chat with John? Have you? <laughs> Hang on, ah. there we go. <laughs> folks, to whoever the last person was. That's great. <laughs> great. Okay, well, could could everyone please show your appreciation in in some way, electronically or, uh, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. So, Dan, thank you so much for your time this evening, and uh, very best of luck with your with your work, and we hope to keep in touch. Great. All right. Thank you very much. See you guys. See you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, and thank you everyone for coming along this evening, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Yeah.